we've got another great interview for you. Uh, this is Dr. Ashley Berner. And Dr. Berner is the Deputy Director for Johns Hopkins Institute for Education Policy. And I have uh, really uh, enjoyed the opportunity to get to know her. And I know you will too, because she's written a fascinating book that should be read by every legislator in the country. It should be read by every educator in the country uh, and anybody who really cares about education as well because this book, it, it changes the perspective. It, it, it changes the perspective in two ways. One is Dr. Berner is a, is a historian by, by training and by passion, I think as well, and uh, has, has brought to bear a, a research that is so well documented. And, and the book is called No One Way to School, Pluralism and American Public Education. Now, I'm going to be uh, proposing that maybe we should change this title just to be American Education because it really does cover more than just public education education, but it's, it addresses a lot of the main issues that are, that, are, that are the big challenges for us today and how do we advance uh, our education in, in the United States well beyond some of the constraints that have kept us uh, in terms of whether it's in urban education or rural education or, or all facets where we know we've got gaps. We know we have gaps. And there are opportunities to to address that. And the other thing I love about this book is if you've if you've ever been involved in debate about maybe uh, maybe you know looking at other options of education, if that's if that's been a passion for you, she's got all the answers for you. It's like your clinics, <laughs> right? So so really encourage you to check out the book. We'll have the links here on the website for you to explore how to get the book and be able to you know look at some of these very important issues for education leadership and reform. So Dr. Berner, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. It's a real honor and thank you for taking the time to read my book. So you mentioned, uh, you know, as, as I said, you know, this idea of, of uh, a pluralism for American education. I mean, really, this <clears throat> isn't this about education in general in the United States? Well, it is. It's about all education. And the premise of a pluralistic system, which we are not at this point, the premise of pluralism is that beliefs matter and diverse beliefs matter. And we have to craft a way to, in education, to honor diverse beliefs while educating for the common good. And so I would say when we speak of public education, it would be ideal to change what we mean by that term. That public education would be government funding, government regulations, but not necessarily government delivery. Right, right. And so uh, some of the typical arguments, right? So, uh, you know, because I've, I've had these a lot in, in, yeah. in the, <laughs> the work that we do uh, in, in a variety of at the state level as well as the national level, right? And so uh -huh. there's, a, there's a lot of resistance around this idea of, well, wait a minute, you know, the, the while the United States may be in the minority, because I think you make that point in the book, mm -hmm. right? That uh, pluralism, we're kind of of the, of the more modern industrialized countries, we're one of the few that doesn't have a pluralistic system. Is that right? That's correct. And most democracies are becoming more pluralistic, not less. Fascinating. But, yeah. but now the argument comes back to, but wait a minute, they don't have separation of church and state, right? I mean, that's, that, that has to be the dominant argument. You address that very clearly in the mm -hmm. book, right? So, and that's why I encourage you that if, if, if you're involved in trying to advocate for change in education, either in your local area or whether you're, where you're either involved in that, even if you're arguing with your, with your brother-in-law, right? This is the kind of stuff that you want to explore. Because I've, I've actually had some recent conversations with, with people on Facebook uh, after the, you know, the, the debate around the, the leadership for the Department of Education. And people <coughs> said they came back with the very same arguments that you identify in the book, right? Those, mm -hmm. those key things. So, so you know, uh, does, does it, I mean, if you simplify that argument, what would you say if someone says, wait a minute, we have this, this church and state, uh, so, you know, there's this clear, you know, constitutional issue. I mean, you can argue from the, from the, the court decisions and it kind of be, kind of be a long argument. If you had to boil it all down though, what would it be? It would be that our government does, our federal courts have prevented and will prevent state direct funding of religious schools, but they will not and have not and have never prevented the funding of religious institutions within certain constraints. Let me just put it more simply. Yeah. If 
you in education, I'm just going to focus on education. If a religious school is funded as a consequence of a neutral law and is a consequence of parents choosing the school, it's constitutional. In the fe- it is federally constitutional. So our federal constitution does not prevent funding going to religious schools. In fact, the term separation of church and state is not in our constitution. And it, it's, uh, it's a trope that Americans say without really knowing what it means. In fact, it's much more nuanced than separation of church and state. Absolutely. Well, very well said. And there, so, yeah, so so do your homework. I mean, know, understand what some of those issues are and be mm-hmm. able to speak to them in a very simplified way. So mm-hmm. whether either on either side, if you want to have an intellectual conversation around education and just around other issues that uh, there's obviously more than just education, separation of church and state, uh, you know, know what it, know what it really says. And well, and, it, and I think it's important for schools, that, you know, particularly religious schools or religious folks to know that there's, while the the government has said we can't endorse a particular religion because that would fly in the face of the Establishment Clause, at the same time, we cannot single out religious beliefs for persecution. We cannot have viewpoint discrimination. So if if a public school has an open policy about student groups, they're not allowed to disallow a Christian or Muslim group. They have to allow them. Yep, a sense. lot of a lot of, of schools and colleges are confused about this. Yeah, no, that's for sure. And, and a lot of it has been decisions made out of fear mm-hmm. rather than really knowing the, the law. And well, there, I mean, the some of the decisions have created some confusion around that, I think, and, fr- and from state to state. But a lot of the training of education leaders has, I think, contributed to that confusion because there, there's a lot of positions expressed, but no real definition. I think that's true, and I think it also affects the classroom engagements. So many, many teachers, particularly in the public sector, but also in the charter sector and some private schools. I taught at an independent school for a while, and I can tell you that this issue pertained. Teachers are afraid of trespassing against students' First Amendment rights and of violating the the, uh, Establishment Clause. And so they don't go into deep debates about meaning and purpose and the good life and ethics. It's a strategy that has unfortunate educational consequences. Yeah, that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. So okay. something about a, a debate about abortion comes up and a teacher will sidestep it rather than say, what do you think about this on what basis? What do you think about this on what basis? Which Got is it. democratic preparation. Absolutely. All right. So when you, you you kind of contrast it in the book, there's this idea of a of, of pluralism. And I don't know that, that we've defined mm-hmm. that well enough for our viewers, because if you haven't read the book, that may be a mm-hmm. term that, that uh, may not resonate with you as clearly. So just for a moment, speak to specifically what, what you mean about this, about pluralism versus the, I think the term you used was a uniform system, right? Right. So in education, you a democracy has to deal with the question of diverse beliefs. How do you manage diverse beliefs? And this is true of every domain of, of a, an open society. And if you're a totalitarian government, no sweat. You just don't have anything but the party line. But a democracy has to cope with differing beliefs in a safe and responsible way. So when it comes to education, there are essentially two solutions or two main solutions. One is to create a uniform school system in which every child from every confession, from every background takes, goes to the same kind of school. And that would be our district school model. And the district schools originally were uniform around Protestant culture. And now they're uniform around a secular culture. The opposite answer is a educational pluralism which says so because education is inherently about beliefs you can't make education neutral even when you don't talk about certain things you're educating students so given that we're going to fund all different kinds of schools england mm-hmm. started doing this in 1837 the netherlands started doing it as a consequence of a lot of of dialogue and conflict actually throughout the 19th century so those are the two different models a uniform system or a pluralistic system 
And in fact, most state constitutions, many state constitutions have the word uniform public schools in it. And we can talk about the historical reasons for that. Yeah, for sure. Well, you mentioned, and especially when we talk about the historical reasons, one of the Mm -hmm. key things that I learned from your book is that one of the drivers behind uh, creating the uniform system, right, was you you mentioned the Protestantism, right? So uh, fascinating pushback on uh, other uh, faith-based education, right, to try to create what what occurred, I guess, in the early 20th century. Mm-hmm. And then in the latter part of the 20th century, that got shifted, right, because of a, co- yes. a couple of different decisions, right? Yes. So talk, talk a little bit more about that. Right. So in the early republic, we funded different kinds of schools. And this was locally driven. And uh, if there was a congregationalist population, they'd fund a congregationalist school. And in larger cities, they, the governments, the municipal governments, would fund Catholic schools, congregationalist schools. There's some evidence of even Jewish schools being funded. We, we, early on in our, we in our had country, pluralistic. we had a pluralistic system. We had a pluralistic system. And Horace Mann, who was the first state secretary of education in Massachusetts, was very worried about pluralism. He was concerned that di- having diverse types of schools would tear apart the democracy. We had to bring everybody together. So he proposed the uniform common school in the 1830s. Now that was anathema. People didn't take, people didn't agree with it. They thought it was, um, you know, it went against democratic principles. What changed that? Huge waves of Catholic immigrants who came to our country in the 1840s and 1850s and throughout the century. And the Catholic immigrants in some towns came close to being a majority population, Boston in particular, but New York and many of the New England small towns, a lot of Catholics. Now, it's hard to imagine now, but there was widespread Protestant suspicion of Catholics, that Catholics were subject to a foreign authority, that Catholic practices were authoritarian and therefore didn't fit with democracy, and that the bottom line was Catholics couldn't really be democratic citizens. And they could be trusted, right. They couldn't be trusted. And, yeah. and, and this was a widespread movement, the nativist movement, the only those born in this country count movement. And the nativists took over a bunch of state legislatures in the 19th century. And you know, they were not only opposed to Catholic immigrants, they were opposed to immigrants who spoke different languages. The first case that the Supreme Court heard about state educations was about foreign language instruction. It's interesting. So the key driver was this fear of division via pluralistic beliefs, in particular Catholic beliefs. Now, the the irony is that most of the research that we have suggests that Catholic schools do a superior job to any other school sector in forming democratic citizens. And there are some reasons for that we can talk about. But it's 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 one of the ironies of history, I think. So we'll talk the, about that for a second, because I think that's that's a very important point. Yeah. So so some of the things that we know really drive student achievement and student citizenship are two things, a strong school culture that has clear aims, a clear mission, and that that goes through every component of a school. Their rituals, their disciplinary practices, their curriculum, how they explain success and failure, for example. That's one. The second is a very rigorous and limited academic curriculum. And the Catholic schools had both. You know, the Catholic, Catholic ethos is service oriented it is other directed and hence the the explanation for why we should be a good citizen and and many of the catholic schools were were under resourced they they simply didn't have the money to offer 50,000 different courses and so they offered a high powered curriculum which everyone had to take well and, is, and a couple other things they also had a a passionate faculty. I mean, their faculty were not just working for the paycheck. They were mission driven, right? That's that's True. one thing that I think was missing in some of that, that research is the faculty culture uh, was, a, was a powerful mechanism for energizing yes. that preparation. Well, uh, so you're, you're right about that. 
there was a discipline, uh, there was a commitment from the families to a discipline that that was more homogeneous. And I think yes. that was another advantage that they had. Well, and I think uh, you're right that I, I did, I, in my book, I certainly didn't pull this out of the research, but Tony Bright's studies and James Coleman's studies of Catholic schools do talk about the faculty as part of the school culture, because for, for a school culture to really stick, it has to be mission driven, whatever that mission is. It can be about Asian philosophy. It can be about performance ethics, or it can be about being made in the image of God. But a, a, a principal, a school leader, has to be able to attract faculty who agree with that for the mission uh, to hold. Exactly. Right? Yes. And that, yes. Right. So, so that's so that's what what was going on in the Catholic schools, and still is to some extent. Um, so anyway, back to the story. Uh, as Catholic schools were being defunded, Catholic schools, which had been funded in this country under our typical pluralistic scenario. And in fact, in New York, places as, as widespread as New York, Cincinnati, Philadelphia, and California funded Catholic schools. And thanks to the nativist movement, which was anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic, and driven by groups such as the Ku Klux Klan. A lot of people don't know this. The Ku Klux Klan used to firebomb Catholic churches and Catholic parishes. Yeah. And the, the Ku Klux Klan included the term separation of church and state in its, in its oath of office. So mm. that became a calling card of nativist groups like the, like the Klan. They ended up taking over state legislatures and passing laws that made education uniform, non-sectarian, non-religious. So here's, here's the part that was dishonest about that. In almost every case, what was in place of pluralism was not just a uniform school, but a uniform Protestant school. And the state legislatures in the early 20th, late 19th, early 20th century passed laws requiring Protestant Bibles to be read, Protestant prayers to be said, which, you know, we know that the majority culture never sees itself as such. So I'm sure it felt neutral to Baptists or Episcopalians, but it wasn't to those who were not Christians. So the unintended consequences of trying to come in and make change and not understand kind of where things can go, you're right. Or, or as they say, you have to be careful what you pray for, right? So there's a, there, you're right. I mean, that's, that's a, uh, that, that part of your book I found to be fascinating because it, mm -hmm. it, it helped me see a, a larger timeline. And, mm -hmm. and again, to understand as even as we're making decisions today, and this is the critical part to me uh, that we have to learn from this type of research is, hey, we're, we're proposing some pretty aggressive changes to our education system. Mm -hmm. right? uh, let's, let's know, let, let's make sure that we've done our research, that we really know where the data mm -hmm. leads and, and take, I know it's, it's a, it's a crazy thing to think, but you know, I think the education of our, ch of our children is important enough that we should be able to kind of step away from the politics of it all and, and, and let's get out of the way. Because the, the issues that we have in American education, they're not children, they're not problems of our children, right? That's right. These are adult problems. That's exactly they're right. Leadership problems, right? And that's the thing that we have to take very seriously if we're going to compete on the stage in a national level and really sustain a level of leadership that I think is incumbent upon us, uh, that that our our children, these gen, this, this generation uh, mm -hmm. that, that we're trading, they've got to be able to compete in an environment that's very different than certainly the one that I was born into, and the and the, mm -hmm. the ability to 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 be able to innovate and not just be a job applier, but be a job creator, to be one who can solve problems. You know, the, mm -hmm. we have to be able to change the the culture of our country as well as of our schools if we're going to compete we we cannot it's not that the way we're doing things now is is good or bad i'm not even going to go on a path mm -hmm. for that. but to me it is incapable of sustaining the the the, the nobleness of that of that good society right mm -hmm. along with just simply being able to compete in this environment if we don't change our education system mm -hmm. so what you're saying touches on the other part of school reform that I don't talk about so much in my book, but that I think is very important, which is the content of education. Mm -hmm. So if your school systems that change mm -hmm. systemically have 
can change along one of three main paths. One is the funding structures. So, you know, do you readjust the property based value system of, of funding? The second is the structure. So do you fund a uniform system or a plural system? How do you make the cut? How do you know what are the accountability structures? That's a change in the structure. And that's what my book is primarily about. The third is the content of education. And this is a serious issue. Uh, when you look at, and this is also an historical, a historical aspect that we don't think about very often, which is that we used to have a college prep curriculum, which everyone was encouraged to take. Most countries, or many high-performing countries, still have this. And in our country, for philosophical reasons, the schools of education decided that academic content was oppressive for children, that psychological development was more about learning how to learn. Criti now you hear this with the critical thinking, right? Well, research does suggest that a knowledge base is important for all of those skills. So to have a skills-based approach particularly harms children from low-income families who don't have the rich knowledge basis that kids from middle-class families have, just talking around the dinner table. And so the, the countries that are very successful educationally have not only a plural structure, but also a high-powered academic curriculum that all the students have to take. Did you look at in, in your research? Did you look at all? Because uh, I know that the, if you look at the the countries that have a high degree of pluralism, mm -hmm. when it comes to the the, the international testing, mm -hmm. and uh, when it comes to just a a, a a I guess an international respect for those school systems, mm -hmm. it seems like the top say ten or fifteen are are, are fairly dominated by plural pluralistic school systems. Is that true? Uh, yes, and I would also say that there are so many factors that go into academic results that I would not be comfortable saying pluralism will inherently lead to right, better right. results because we could have you could have a lot of choices, but they could all be terrible academically. Uh, I, I mean, there. They, so, 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 but yes, I, I think my, my, I think the point that I would make is that pluralism certainly doesn't harm academic outcomes and it is likely to improve them got it very good well yeah. you know I, as, I, as i mentioned to you before we we, we uh, started our interview together this this is uh, a book that i have carved up i mean i have got asterisks and underline and question marks and I'll, we're, we're gonna have we're gonna have more conversations i promise you about this book because because there's just some great topics especially about you know how do you scale some of those schools that have been remarkably successful because you know I was fascinated one time I uh, watched an interview that, that Bill Gates had mm -hmm. and he, he in, the, in the interview he was asked okay so you've put hundreds of millions of dollars into education reform particularly here in the United States and you you visited other countries you've seen you know all these these great systems so who would you trade with if you could trade with Finland or or South Korea or or you know uh, these other Singapore or these other countries, pick one. And if you could trade our uh, the United yeah. States education system with that one, who would you trade with? And you know his answer was, of course, none of them. And, and it was none of them because he said he went on to explain that the diversity, of course, in the United States is very different from a lot of those countries, the culture that we have. But his his key point was this: the United States has remarkable schools; they're just not pervasive enough right and that ability to scale highly successful schools is, is a, has been a, a big inhibitor to us achieving how, how, I mean I've been I've been, in the last yeah. 24 months alone you know we've, we've been at over 800 schools in some form or fashion either digitally or live and it's mm -hmm. I mean we've seen schools that are just like wow I'd love to have my kids yeah. and grandkids in this school I mean that would be amazing right and yeah. there's others that are like how in the world could parents even tolerate a school like this and, and right. you know but but we we do have to figure out and, and a way to 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 replicate that success that's one of the things that we've been focused on at school growth is you know how do we do that how do we how do we capture those top you know performers those top one two percent those outliers right. and replicate that success across the country Right. And then the interesting thing is that well-performing charter systems, such as the one in Massachusetts, make, they have 
they assume that there will be new people coming into the market, as it were, and they, they make sure there's a high bar for inclusion and there are benchmarks they have to hit to stay open. But there's no analog in the private school sector. There's not, there's not a state law that allows school choice, to my knowledge, that really makes it easy for new people to come in or for strong schools even to add another grade. Because think about it, to add another grade to a high-performing, say, K-8 school, you have, to ha you have to be assured that you're going to have enough students, that the funding streams are not going to be cut off for some reason, that they're not year-on-year -year approved by the legislature. A lot yeah. of risk. A lot and, of and, for, and for a new school, most of the laws require, before you can receive scholarship students, most laws require several years of accreditation. So there needs to be some kind of interim period in which the state oversees the school while they pursue accreditation. Otherwise, the barriers to entry are too great. Facilities funding is another one. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, <laughs> having started quite a few schools, there are significant uh, barriers to entry for, yeah. uh, especially for independent schools, uh, yeah. being able to overcome. I mean, you have to think like an entrepreneur as much as an educator and being able to you know, pull from the, the expertise of both of those worlds. Uh, that's, it's a heavy lift. Yes. For yes. sure. And, and something that the private sector does a little bit more handily than the public sector. Yeah, uh, very much so. Well, they have to, yeah. and there's a, there's a pressure to yeah. either succeed or you, you go yeah. out of business. Right. Uh, right. I, I heard one, uh, I think it was Jay Green in Arkansas said, uh, University of Arkansas say, hey, it's, it's actually a good thing to see some schools go out of business, right? That's yes. part of that natural uh, you know, market selection uh, where families get to choose a demand-driven education. You know, there's some, there's some things we have to consider. So here's the here's my last question for you: If you if if you were you know, speak now to uh, the the person who's involved in either at, at, a, at a state or federal level, they're they're involved in some form of influence in. Uh, policy around education. Mm -hmm. What are the questions? What are the say the the one or two key questions that you would encourage them to ask in the process of evaluating their options? Hmm. So I think the most important questions to ask are about excellence and equity. Is the law that I'm proposing is it going to open up access for families that haven't had access? And there are elements of different laws internationally that can make that more or less likely. And the second is, is it is what I'm doing likely to expand excellence? Is it is it about choice in and of itself, which I think may be inadequate, or does it is it going to promote excellence and on what basis? And I think the largest overall question they could ask is about the, the terms of debate. How can I shift the terms of debate so that I'm not pulling against the uniform system without, without being aware that I'm doing so? How can I challenge the terms of debate that public education equals a district school? Got it. Very good. Well, hey, I highly recommend the book. Uh, it's, uh, again, No One Way to School, Pluralism in American Public Education. We'll have the links. Uh, uh, Ashley's got a page on the, the website for the Johns Hopkins Institute for Education Policy uh, for some more details there. And then we'll also include the link if you want to go buy the book. It's, it's a great one. We have a little reading group around. We may actually host one on, on schoolgrowth.com to kind of foster some of these conversations because it's it's vital. I mean, these are these are questions that have to be asked at every national level across the around the world. But we've got to answer, uh, be able to address these questions here in the United States. So, Ashley, thank you so much for your contribution uh, to that dialogue. This is uh, very important. I encourage you to check out uh, more information again that we'll have here on the site about the, this research and encourage you to, to get this book as soon as possible. Again, thanks for joining us, Ashley. Thanks for having me and thanks for all the work you do on the front lines every day. Thanks.